This is uh, Trust the Prophets YouTube page. Please, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much for your support. This is what we are calling our barn tours. And Matt made this series really popular with the Breeders' Cup. And obviously the Breeders' Cup, the barns are a lot bigger, but we thought why not uh, apply it here? We're going to do it with the trainers that have more than one entry, ideally. Uh, so it'll be Todd Pletcher, Brad Cox, and Tim Yakteen. This is the Todd Pletcher barn tour for the Kentucky Derby. Matt, Todd Pletcher's had a lot of entries going back to 2000 in the Kentucky Derby. He's had success. He knows what it's like to win. But when you think about having 62 entries and only two winners, I guess the percentages there is not really what you want. Um, right. What's your first thoughts on that? Does that make you pause? It's definitely something to take note of because it's something that I also discovered when I was doing this barn tour for Pletcher's entries in the Breeders' Cup, that he didn't have a lot of success in the Breeders' Cup. Similar story. Tons of entries since 2000, 143 entries in the Breeders' Cup, only 12 wins, 8% win rate. Here you have 62 entries, two wins in the Derby with Super Saver and Always Dreaming. That's only about a 3% win rate. So it, it is concerning that Pletcher can get him to the starting gate. I mean, that's kind of his reputation to some extent as a trainer and as an trainer that does right by his owners to some extent. He gets them in the starting gate. He knows how to get a horse ready to be on the Derby trail and into the Kentucky Derby, but sealing the deal, a little bit challenging. And he's got, I think, three very legitimate contenders that we're looking at this year. But those statistics definitely give you a moment of pause to think maybe I need to look elsewhere for a potential winner. Yeah, there's just two winners, 2010 Super Saver, 2017 Always Dreaming. In fact, since 2018, Audible finished third. He hasn't hit the board since Audible. Uh, that's 0 for 10 in hitting the board. And obviously, you can't apply previous history to current history. It's important to remember that. You can with a horse, right? I mean, you <laughs> yeah. can look at the past performances and go, okay, well, I kind of know what I'm going to get from this horse. But be very yeah. careful in just saying, um, you know, 62 starters only has two wins. I'm going to toss him. For a while, it was when's he going to finally get that first win? Obviously, it right. took 10 years. There was a little bit of a fade factor there. But I think you bring up an interesting point on, you know, we talk about athletes in their the big days, right? And how do they yeah. do in the big game? How do they do in the playoffs? Well, the Breeders' Cup stat that you looked up for us on this show and coupled with that Kentucky Derby stat is not something that you're running to the windows and betting Todd Pletcher in the Derby just because it's Todd Pletcher like you might up at Saratoga on a, over a two-year-old. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he's he's a trainer who, again, he can he's very good at getting them ready, especially as we talk through these three horses that he has and there's kind of a fourth that's an outlier a little bit major dude who's kind of on the outside looking in but when you talk about Forte, Tapatrice, and Kings Barnes you see the brilliance of Todd Pletcher in the way he matures these horses in the way he navigates these horses around to different circuits and different tracks how he managed to have these three really I would say three of the top 10 contenders I, I think that's probably you know, pretty generous, or maybe even three of the top eight contenders in this year's Derby, they've never run against each other. You know, he's very strategic about making sure, okay, we're going to give this one his time to shot in this race, and this one is shot in that race, and this one is shot in a third race. That that takes a lot of skill to be able to, in that balancing act, but I think it does demonstrate that his greatest skill is getting horses to the Derby, not necessarily across the finish line first, even though he's had some very, very good horses, obviously, that have gone on to do great things in their careers after that. Yeah, those are the three starters. So we have Forte, Tapatrice, and Kings Barnes. And as you mentioned, two of those are certainly going to be uh, Forte's your favorite, Tapatrice most likely probably your second favorite, yeah. uh, and then Kings Barnes. So that leads me to my next question of uh, what's kind of unique about the three as you go through them? And maybe we start with Forte. He's going to be the morning line favorite, but we have yeah. to mind that we're only focusing on the Pletcher Barn Tour, okay? So we want to, as we're talking about Forte, think about how that's going to affect maybe a tap at Trice or a Kings Barn. We'll do that with all three of them. But let's start with Forte. Yeah. Um, how did he get here? And what's unique about him? Well, what's unique about him is he's got by far and away the best credentials of any horse in the field and certainly is Pletcher's most standout uh, horse in that he had a brilliant juvenile campaign, that Breeders' Cup Futurity victory over Loggins down at Keeneland, 
Then you go and he follows that up with a dominant effort in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile where he dispatches Cave Rock, who was everybody thought was Bob Baffert's monster coming in from California. And he just made him look silly kind of at the end, just blowing right by him. Showed so much class. Then took such a long time off, went down to Pletcher's training facility in South Florida at near Gulfstream Park, then comes back in the Fountain of Youth, wins that race. He stays at the Gulfstream Park to run in the Florida Derby. Over, It shows a lot of versatility and overcoming a bad post position, coming all the way from the back. That was a day I was there in person. I didn't think he was going to get there until he got there. And he was such an impressive effort there. So he's he is unusual among these three Pletcher horses in particular because he's got the biggest resume by far. He's got that two-year-old foundation, whereas Tappet Trice and Kings Barnes a little bit of nouveau riche. They're a little bit of new money. They're a little bit of these three-year-olds who just kind of popped up onto the scene really recently and don't have that two-year-old foundation that Forte does. What Forte is going to need is probably some pace to run at up front. His Brisnet running style is a P3. Me and you both kind of think that's a little maybe, you know, the P3, the P means that the horses prefer to run kind of four to seven lengths behind the leader. I don't necessarily think he really likes to be that far back. I do think he likes to be out in the clear and, and wants yeah. to have you know, he's, he's run all of his races a lot longer than the rest of his competition because he gets out and he's out in the center of the track and he comes around that turn and, and he wants to make sure that he's clear. Um, is You don't agree necessarily with the P3 or do you think that's his style? I think it just depends on post position to some extent. I mean, I think the what you saw at the Florida Derby was a great example of that. It was he was stuck kind of far outside. They tried to kind of gun it to the lead and it wasn't going to work. And so they pulled back. He ended up being a lot further back, I think, in that race than maybe he anticipated. And... As a result, they sat further back. But the, if there are races, if you go back in his PPs, where he's sitting really close to the lead. So he's versatile in that if there's not a lot of pace, he can take advantage of it and be close. But I, I think he's probably a stalking to mid-pack horse. I would say that four to seven lengths, I'd probably be a little bit closer to the four than the seven, I think, for him. But I think that's generally probably not too far off, especially in a race like the Kentucky Derby, where the field's going to be so strung out, one to 20. The training job for Todd Pletcher for this horse compared to maybe the others has been probably a little bit on the easier side. I mean, Forte has just, uh, he's shown up and he's performed every time going back to that futurity with logins. Yeah. Um, you know, there hasn't been a whole, you know, it's kind of been, he was the last real main contender to come on to the scene in 2023, right? We were, yeah. as we were going through the preps, we were waiting for Forte to come on and he came on in the fountain of youth and really put away that field. Um, and then there was the question mark in the Florida Derby where, I'll call it, you know, I'll use the word lazy. It almost felt mm -hmm. like he got a little bit lazy and kind of was like, you know, you kind of had to wake him up. Um, he's also shown in the paddock before, I think, the Florida Derby to, you know, show a little sweat. Um, and, you know, it's kind of not, don't always think of that as a bad thing. You know, athletes are getting amped up and maybe that's just kind of what Forte is waiting for now. You know, the 60,000 at the Florida Derby is going to be a lot different than the 120,000 at the Kentucky <laughs> yeah. Derby. Yeah. Um, but if you see that happening before, I don't know that that's necessarily something to get worried about. But do you feel, um, is there a concern for you that Forte may kind of lose focus? And if he doesn't wake up in time coming down the stretch, then he's it's going to be over. It's really interesting you use that term, lose focus, because I do feel like that is an ongoing issue with Pletcher horses recently that they tend to lose focus down the backside. Sometimes that seems like they lose interest in running and then they kind of re-engage and coming down the stretch. And sometimes it's a little too late to make up that ground that they've lost while they're not particularly engaged. I mean, Mo Donegal is a horse that last year kind of had that issue of just like, what are we doing? You know, when are we going to get in the rhythm of the race? And then finally kicking in and, and kind of going, uh, coming for home, obviously won the Belmont, but it was, uh, you know, you do see sometimes his horses showing a little bit of lack of interest. You know, Forte, I am worried about Forte more so because he kind of is the same horse he was as a two-year-old. We've mm -hmm. not seen a massive jump in terms of speed figures from two to three. He is kind of roughly the same horse he was. Now, he was a very, very good two-year-old, and there's no necessary standouts in this three-year-old crop. So I think it's fair to say perhaps he can, you know, perhaps he can skate by continuing to be as good as he was. But, you know, I would have liked to seen a little bit more progression from him before the Kentucky Derby 
that's going to be a big stage for him to take another step forward, presumably to a 100 plus buyer speed figure and an even higher Brisnet score. The analogy I've been thinking about for Forte is remember back in eighth grade when you had that one kid that hit puberty before everybody else, <laughs> Brian. He's on, I remember him well. Yes. He's on your baseball team, just raking home runs. You, you yeah. know, you're trying to pitch to him. And you're like, Oh my God. And yeah. then you hit senior year and he's the same and everyone else has caught up to him. And it's like, Oh, yeah. he's actually not as good as, you know, I'm, I'm as good as him now because we've all grown into our bodies and we've yep. gotten bigger. I wonder if that's a little bit of Forte, you know, at two, at two, he was just a monster over the, the crop. And I think yep. we've seen steady progression from the other horses now where he hasn't taken another step forward. If he did, then I think we could easily be talking triple crown. Yep. Um, and I think he's come back to the pack a little bit. And that's kind of the analogy that I like to use for Forte. Next up, Tappet Trice. How did he uh, make his way into the Kentucky Derby field? Yeah, this was, again, kind of a masterful way of weaving <laughs> Pletcher's horses between different tracks. And so he started, you know, down at Gulfstream Park in terms of, you know, breaking his maiden and running an allowance race down there. But it was obvious if he stayed at Gulfstream Park, he was going to run up against Forte. Well, you don't, you don't want to do that. So what does he do? They moves him to ta the Tampa Bay Derby which not to jump at the shark, but that's where Kings Barnes was too. So then there was kind of an understanding of like, well, we don't want to put these two together against each other. So we're going to move Tappet Trice to Keeneland in the bluegrass next. So he's kind of hopping around a little bit, traveling around. So he's not going up against other Pletcher horses. Obviously the Tampa Bay Derby, everybody remembers, completely blows the break. And is, is and Louis Saez is having to work overtime on that horse to try to get him engaged again pay attention let's go and down the backside finally starts to get engaged and then you think it's impossible for him to make it there and he just comes blowing by the field in the home stretch it was not a high speed figure but it was a visually impressive effort then you saw the bluegrass got away a little bit better Saez gets him out in the clear moves him up a little bit closer to be a little bit more engaged than he was earlier and then has that great home stretch run against verifying where he ends up winning by about a half length. So very impressive effort, but he is a horse that you do question. Can you get out of the gate? You know, when there's, tw when there's 19 other horses, tap at Trice's Kentucky Derby could be over in the first two steps. In my opinion, that's really kind of the volatility. I feel like you have with him. He can be brilliant, but the, you cannot put yourself in that much of a deficit in this large of a field. Yeah, and speaking of that, we did a great breakdown on Tapatrice. All his races with highlights of where he was. He, we show that break. We show the finish. We show where he likes to be. So check that out. It's on our channel. We got you covered from every angle up to the wazoo. Um, and speaking of that running style, we Brisnet running style is a P4. Prefers to run four to seven lengths behind the leader. I think that that's a lot more accurate for Tapper Trice, but it might be because he doesn't have a choice if you break last. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. No, sometimes he's 20 lengths behind the leader, uh, and it, other times he's a little bit closer up. I think the question that you're going to get is, I think post position is going to be important for him, obviously. How does he get away? And, you know, he obviously handled the inside rail very well at Keeneland in the last effort in the bluegrass. But I think the question will be, is he surrounded by other horses that are speed? Does he get shuffled back a little bit? And then again, what I mentioned is not all that dissimilar from Forte. You mentioned like being outside in the clear. What Saez did on Tap at Trice was very smart, taking this horse way outside too, around that back stretch, around the backside, and moving that horse outside. That's not an easy trip to get in the Kentucky Derby. And also going wide at a mile and a quarter is usually not something that's advisable. Obviously, the pedigree would suggest Tappet Trice can take all the distance, but it still is a little bit worried. Do you get the right trip with him or do you get him stuck inside, raiding, getting kicked back? I don't know how much he's necessarily going to like that. He's your gray. He's going to take the gray money, one of the grays in the field. So <laughs> yes. uh, here, he is, here he is working out this week. Uh, so Forte, Tappet Trice, where do you tend to be? Between I, those two. Uh, you know, between those two, I probably am a little bit match more race. on Forte. Uh, yeah, in a match race, I definitely am uh, more on Forte because he'll just get the jump. Uh, and I think he's got this kind of champion's class of not wanting to lose. I, I think you see that out of Tappet Trice as well. You see a lot of grit with him, obviously, that Tampa Bay Derby. But I just, I'm a little bit worried, especially in a Kentucky Derby field, about that ability to get away cleanly from the gate, where he's going to sit, what sort of trips he's going to make out. I could see him coming running late at the end and making up a lot of ground and just falling short, but uh, he's a supremely talented Colt. I, I do worry about how engaged he's going to be, though. 
he does have those rising speed figures, which you are does, always, yep. which you are always a fan of. Uh, mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about it, which I do want to touch on before we get into Kings Barnes. Is the job Pletcher has done avoiding each other, uh, yeah. and why do you, why is that? Why do you think he's uh, moving these horses from courses from uh, track to track? Yeah, well, it's because the three horses we're talking about today have three different ownership groups, and trainers are employees. I think sometimes we don't think of them that way, but they are. They are employees of the owners. The owners want to get their horses to the Kentucky Derby. And you're not going to get your horse to the Kentucky Derby if you run them against each other. And they cannibalize and kind of eat up points. Especially this year where we saw a second place finish and even the final prep race did not guarantee your spot in the Kentucky Derby. We see this with a horse like Mandarin Hero, uh, who finished second at the Santa Anita Derby, is not going to make it into the field. So those are things that when you are a trainer for horses that have multiple ownership interests, you have to be very cognizant of how do I serve my employer, basically, who wants a derby horse, and how do I get them around and navigate them to those different tracks so that they can maximize their point totals, basically. A tricky game the trainers must play as well. Uh, so third on the list for Todd Pletcher is Kings Barnes. He was the winner of your Louisiana Derby where he went wire to wire. And I think people are seeing that and saying, well, there's no pace in the Kentucky Derby. So here's a horse that you should be interested in. I think mm -hmm. that the Louisiana Derby was slow. Mm -hmm. So it was deceiving. And to me, I think we have it right on the order of this video right here that he's the third of these three horses. So please tell me uh, if I'm thinking of it that way, why I should be interested at all in Pletcher's third horse, who, yeah, went wire to wire in Louisiana Derby, also did not run at age two. Remember that whole right. uh, curse of Apollo and not running at age two until yeah. um, Justify? Justify. Yeah. Uh, yeah, broke that. And, you know, that we talk about having a strong foundation to in order to win the Kentucky Derby. So here's Kings Barnes with, to me, that's three negatives I gave you. I can keep going. <laughs> um, why should I be interested in Kings Barnes and are you at all? Well, it, we talked about how each of these horses kind of may, may not complement each other, but it's interesting how they do have three different kind of running styles to some extent where Kings Barnes, if you're going to be interested in with, uh, with him, it's the pace. It's the fact that he's going to be on or near the lead in a race that does not have a lot of pace. Now, as of recording this, Jace's Road just has drawn into the race uh, because Blazing Sevens has dropped out. Jace's Road is going to represent early speed. It's important to remember, Jace's Road was in the Louisiana Derby with Kings Barnes, and guess what he did that day? He raided behind Kings Barnes, and he let Kings Barnes get away with super slow fractions up front. Now, what I'll say about Kings Barnes is, yes, he ran the first three quarters of that Louisiana Derby in 114-3, and three, which is crawling, Okay. But, A, they let him do that. And, B, once he kicked for home, he blew away the rest of the – I mean, he pulled away easily. So you would think that if everybody's going slow, that, okay, everybody's going to have a little extra kick coming for home. He was the one who by far and away had the best kick coming for home. Uh, now, you could say maybe that Louisiana Derby wasn't particularly strong. Disarm came back and ran, I think, a disappointing third in the eyes of a lot of people at the Lexington Stakes. I, again, that's a tricky situation because he's coming back on short rest uh, in that race. So I don't necessarily hold that against him. But I think if you're going to make a case for Kings Barnes, it's, I know what type of trip he's going to get. And it's a trip that, historically speaking, at the Kentucky Derby in the last 25 years has been a winning trip. Get out on the lead, near the lead, and go basically gate to wire or close to it and stay in that front group of four, three, four horses, and then make your move coming for home. Yeah, his key victory was really just the Louisiana Derby, but I think that yeah. that's a little overrated as far as pace. I wonder if the pace is going to be faster than we're all giving your credit for, because A, it's the Kentucky Derby. B, everyone's thinking the exact same we're thinking. It's not like, right. you know, we're certainly not smarter than the trainers and the jockeys. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, yeah. it lends me to think that it's going to be quicker than we think it will be. So I don't think he's going to have this nice, easy coasting, oh, I'm all by myself out here. Um, and let's see what he can do in, in those circumstances. It's fair to say, it, that's totally fair, because you figure Jace's Road is probably going to be more aggressive than he was in the Louisiana Derby. You figure that verifying is going to want to go out there <clears throat> and be pretty forwardly placed. And you also figure, of course, even like Wild on Ice is is probably going to go, because that's kind of their only 
hope is to kind of be pretty forward and be pretty aggressive, not necessarily on the lead, but close to it. Um, and so, yeah, and it's the Kentucky Derby. Everybody's going to, you're right. Everybody's going to be jockeying for that good position up in the front. I, and you're right. I, it's something that I always try to remind myself. Trainers and jockeys look at the PPs as well. And they can see it when a race has no pace and they can see when a race has a lot of pace and they can sometimes take a horse back that you would think is going to be on the lead because they want to avoid that. Uh, that said, you don't want to put your horse in a situation where they're not comfortable. So I do think some of these horses that are more kind of stalking horses, it, it's a fine line for the trainers to press to go get up there on the lead, get up there on the pace. Well, the horse might not want that. The horse might not respond very well to that. And so you want to be careful about doing what's right by the horse, doing what's right for their own, you know, trip, as opposed to there's a lack of speed in this race. We're going to try to take advantage of it and maybe put a horse in a situation where they don't excel. But, um, you know, we'll see if he can handle certainly a faster pace. But the thing about Kings Barnes, we should point out those first two efforts, his maiden debut at Gulfstream and then his allowance victory at Tampa Bay, both of those victories, he actually let another horse go out in front initially and raided off that horse before taking the lead coming down the backstretch, basically. So he's got ability to rate. He doesn't need the lead, and he can sit off a little bit. So he does have some versatility in that regard. Yeah, I think confidence game might go. Rocket can might go. Um, they've, they've shown in other races to be up front and be closer than I think we might be given for. Derma as well, obviously, in the UAE yeah. Derby went. Yeah. Um, and you never know. You never know that it's just going to be uh, this the slower pace than you might expect. Absolutely. Anything else to add on the Todd Pletcher barn? Well, I think the the interesting thing is that you do have you have a front runner in Kings Barns. You got a solid stalker mid pack in Forte, and then you have a horse that is a little bit of a wild card in Tapa Trice. He could be dead last, and or he could be sitting like seventh, and we just don't know until the gates open, honestly. And so there's some versa, there's volatility there. I think that this feels like another year where Pletcher has got three really nice horses. I don't know if I'm going to pick any of these horses to win the Kentucky Derby, though. Uh, and I really only see one of them as a really solid bet to hit the board, and that's probably Forte, uh, who I just think is – he's just got a lot of class. And I just think he's very similar to a horse like Essential Quality or Epicenter. He's just going to run his race, and he's going to be super honest, and he's just really good. Uh, and so I, those other horses are a little bit boom and bust. Two for 62 doesn't give you a lot of confidence going to the betting window, that's for sure. All right, so we'll wrap this up. I want to know, we, we, as we mentioned, we're doing three barn tours, Cox, Pletcher, Yak, Team. Mm -hmm. Would Pletcher be the barn that you pick over the other two? I don't want to know. Ooh. Um, oh, it's Colin, that's a tough one. I actually probably would take Pletcher over the other two. Uh if if you combine the two Japanese as a, a barn, I would probably take them. But uh, but if, for those three, I would take uh, I will take Pletcher's over the other two. Yes, there you have it. Please like and subscribe. We're going on to the uh, Cox and Yak Team Barn. There's more content coming at you than you can handle. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, Matt. It's now post time.